to those of you I've not met before, my name is Deborah Young and I'm the CEO of the RegTech Association. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and offer a very warm welcome to our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander friends with us here today. And a warm welcome to you if you're members and special guests um, of the association. Um, really pleased to report um, this is a new area um, identified in RegTech and we've attracted 120 registrations from eight different countries. Um, there's about 25 regulated institutions, 17 regulators and government agencies and um, more than 30 uh, red tech companies. So thank you very much for being with us. Um, for us, this started a few years ago um, when I was invited uh, to a Senate inquiry um, at Parliament House in Canberra and the former small business and family enterprise ombudsman, uh, Kate Carnell, um, attended and she was underlining the importance of RegTech in its many applications for small business and specifically around workforce solutions. And it's, this was in light of many complaints of non-compliance around um, award wages and some very high profile cases. If I could just ask everybody to remain on mute and unless you're a speaker, if you could turn your camera off too, that would be awesome. Thanks very much. Um, we really began to explore this area of workforce solutions and here we are at our first dedicated um, program around employee compliance. And I checked our directory this morning, there are now 12 members that have solutions in this space. And uh, you know, probably 12 months ago, we, did, we didn't have any. So it's fantastic growth. And so this program today is our Burning Platform Issues program that we highlight an important matter allow for a discussion and then a series of short presentations to give the attendees some ideas about how these real challenges um, can be addressed. We're sending clear messages to the government and also to the small business community about the applicability of RegTech beyond traditional use cases, which is com most commonly aligned with financial services. And we are going to see today's example of what every business in Australia needs to do well, and that is employment compliance, keeping employees safe, uh, companies thriving and regulators satisfied uh, for a safe and trusting system. Yesterday, um, I had the pleasure um, of presenting at a Chartered Accountants Australia and New Zealand event on RegTech. And a case study was presented um, by someone who's actually also presenting today on this very important subject. And I've got to say it was a very animated and enthusiastic discussion about the future of RegTech and this particular area of employment compliance. We've invited Craig Latham, the de deputy for the Office of the Australian Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman to come and kick us off with a bit of an environmental scan around the importance of work for solutions and how these are vital to small business in reducing regulatory burdens and safeguarding businesses against fines and the reputational damage um, that can result from that. And then we're going to have a series of presentations from the Fair Work Commission, the Attorney General's Office, and then um, a series as well of presentations from some fantastic reg tech companies, Cassie from Carol Clark, Rowena from Foundu, and Mark Jenkins from Wage Safe. Um, and then Craig will lead the speakers onto a panel discussion. So just uh, for some housekeeping before we start, if um, everybody could um, uh, turn cameras off except for the person that's speaking and for the speakers, we'll invite you uh, to turn on your cameras when it's uh, your turn to speak. Uh, thank you very much. All questions, if you could place those in the uh, chat function, that would be awesome and we will pick them up from there. We'll be encouraging the speakers to dive on there directly and address anything uh, directly with uh, the person asking the question. So please make it clear who your question is directed to so that person can respond. Anything um, that we don't get to on the chat, I'll surface up to Craig so that he could uh, potentially ask that during the panel. We are recording today, so nothing will be missed. Um, and we will email you the recording afterwards. We will also be doing a quality poll towards the conclusion of the event and we really do appreciate your feedback. So please let us know how you think we went um, today. Um, 
So I think without further ado, I'm now going to hand to uh, Craig, um, who's going to take us through a bit of an overview and then we'll kick off with the other presentations. Uh, welcome, Craig, and thanks very much for being with us. No, thank, thanks, Deborah, and hello all. So I, I'm actually coming to you from Ngunnawal land, which is uh, in Canberra. Um, look, it's been an incredibly difficult last um, two plus years for small business. Uh, we've had the COVID um, and still having it, but um, the floods, uh, fires, drought, uh, it's been a tremendous period of uh, stress for small business. Um, interestingly, um, MIOB uh, SME success report said that as a result of that trial, 12% um, of businesses have actually become more resilient. And I think uh, a lot of today will be around the opportunities for small businesses uh, and other businesses for that matter, uh, to take different approaches to the way that they go about their business, um, to increase their resilience in the face of whatever challenge comes next. So on the next slide, I've got a little bit of a run through of uh, the small business landscape. 97% um, of all businesses are small. This is using an up to 20 employee uh, threshold. This is ABS figures. Uh, interestingly, and I'll get on to a little bit about our office, um, but our office uses up to 100 employees. So we get very much into the me part of SME. Um, you'll see in that, that little pie chart there that um, the vast majority, uh, well, a majority of small businesses anyway, don't have any employees. But then um, very quickly, um, what are we looking at? Approaching half, half of uh, businesses will have uh, some levels of employees. And there's some really critical periods that we see here where that there's a step from that very light green area into the darker green. Um, so the movement to one employee is a big step for many businesses. Uh, then there's there's the around sort of the one to five, then there's the five to say 20 and then 20 and beyond. All significant steps, all requiring uh, different types of processes and approaches to running the business. The next little portion of that slide talks to um, some of the industries where small business also are quite dominant. Uh, so when you're looking at industries like uh, the rental industry, real estate, a lot of ag and building, uh, predominantly are sort of small business industries. Um, Small businesses employ a lot of people, 4.7 million, contribute 4, 422 billion uh, per annum to the Australian economy. And really importantly, it's the largest, small businesses are the largest employer of apprentices and trainees. So really the future of uh, our country uh, rests with uh, small businesses. The, the next slide shows a little bit around um, how we um, operate. So um, basically we have uh, two functions under our legislation. Our legislation is the Australian Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman Act 2015. It says we have two functions, advocate and assist. Uh, to support those and as part of those functions, we also have communication, or communicate and inform. And, and just recently have set up a, a, a strong uh, data capability and you'll be seeing a lot more of that in the future. So already, uh, in the past, we've been issuing uh, a document called Small Business Counts. Uh, we're updating that. And so you'll see uh, a lot of data coming out. Our, our data focus is both internal to help our advocacy, assistance and communication, but it's going to be very external. And uh, we'll be quite excited when we, we get there as well around creation of data cubes and other things that uh, will be of tremendous help um, to, to, to you. Um, so around advocacy, basically this talks to um, giving voice to small business into uh, parliamentary process and, and other government sorts of process. Uh, so again, um, we, will, we will hold our own inquiries, we will do research and provide that, publicise it. We'll uh, do submissions to various processes to make sure that um, regulation uh, and other activities of government are small business uh, appropriate. Um, around the assistance, and I'll go into this in a little bit more detail shortly, but this is around providing some guidance when mostly when people are in dispute uh, and then helping them resolve those disputes. Information I've spoken about with the, the data capability and communication fires uh, those other cylinders for us. So the next slide shows 
uh, a little bit about uh, our assistance function. So we're getting over 7,000 requests for assistance per annum. They can come in in, in various ways. Uh, we're very open, we have an info line, uh, nine seconds for, I think it's 92% or something of all our calls are answered within nine seconds. Uh, we have online forms, uh, we have email, telephone. Uh, so very open uh, to people uh, coming into us, raising, requesting information, raising disputes. Uh, and, and we help with those. Uh, then we also have coverage of uh, a number of the industry codes. So dairy, franchising, horticulture and oil uh, all have mediation slash conciliation and some have also arbitration under them. And so we help again around disputes there. So an established process, but we help organise um, access to uh, mediators, etc. And we also do um, what we call the small business tax concierge service. So this has been particularly important uh, to, during COVID times around things like JobKeeper and the cash flow boost. So where you get to the end of all the ATO internal uh, um, escalation points, you get the letter from uh, the commissioner saying, well, this is it. This is what you got to got to now do. Um, that's when we will help uh, get you some uh, legal advice as to whether um, it's worth appealing to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. Uh, that's uh, subsidised by us. You pay $100, we pay the rest. And then should um, a small business go on and lodge an appeal with the AAT, then we'll cover another hour, full another hour with um, a tax litigator to really help people judge whether it's worth uh, going on and uh, how best to do it going forth. Now, the next slide starts to dig into just um, one of our main games. It's around disputes. So it's a no wrong door, that policy that we operate here. So we don't duplicate other organisations' um, operations. So we help you get to the right spot to help with your dispute. So for example, um, like a banking matter that might come to us, we'd say, well, the Australian Financial Complaints Authority is the best way to go and we'll help you get there and make sure that's seamless, a warm transfer, and you sort of know what you're doing. Um, we have some tools uh, that are um, uh, can help us get the information that 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 uh, is often difficult to get to define what the dispute is and 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 who the parties are and where it should be dealt with, uh, and we can also if the matter uh, sits with us, so we're like the residual, if we don't uh, have a, a, a spot for you to go to, we will then pick up uh, the dispute. And if we do, we can then recommend a variety of types of alternative dispute resolution, mediation, conciliation, case appraisal, and a bunch of others. Uh, and then should either party then uh, choose not to go forth with that, we can actually uh, call it out and, and provide a warning online and in trade journals and things about when you deal with this um, party, uh, then they may not actually um, seek to resolve a dispute and force you to uh, go to court or abandon the dispute. We use um, an interest-based approach so we look at what are the interests of people. It is about negotiation and helping the parties understand what it is they're arguing about and negotiating it. Um, or as I always say, there's always three sides to every story that we see. So the side from, the side from one party, the side from the other party, and this other side that needs to be unearthed uh, to help uh, resolve the dispute. The sorts of disputes we see many and various. I've mentioned banking, I've mentioned some of those industry codes, but we, we had debanking disputes. So this is the banks um, choosing not to operate in areas like um, the adult services industry, but there's a bunch of uh, industries, highly regulated often, that the banks are choosing uh, to not provide banking services to. But we see all sorts of other things. We, we see search engine optimization uh, providers are another one that we get to see a lot of, uh, retention of passwords until payments are made, disputes over whether good jobs were done. We've seen issues around multi-function multi printers, um, things that would normally cost maybe 10 grand, maybe 20, uh, ending up costing businesses to exit contracts uh, could be up to like over $100,000. So um, we help with um, where there are contract disputes 
or disputes with government for that matter as well. So um, a part of our work is helping people. I've mentioned tax, but it could, could be a, a complaint about any uh, Commonwealth government department and we can help uh, with the dispute or get you to the right spot uh, to deal with it. Uh, the next slide is just a, a picture and this is uh, moving now into sort of the more the reg tech type space. Um, and thinking about COVID, I've already mentioned the resilience of businesses um, certainly um, has uh, had a kick, uh, has had to have a kick. kick. Uh, 50 per cent of businesses have actually changed their business model during COVID. Um, one in five businesses uh, have reported moving to remote work and finding new customers. So significant changes going on. And alongside this, uh, RegTech uh, certainly has a lot to offer. And that, that picture there is uh, referencing smart e tags for cows that can do geolocation and biosecurity. But we see it. Uh, also, and we've had matters come to us, disputes over um, the data from tractors and the mapping of where tractors move, for example. Um, smart contracts uh, emerging and the ability to um, verify the supply chain. And again, these things are going to be really important in a regulatory sense around um, the, the movement for environmental social governance and the importance of that, so sustainability and ethical practices and showing that they're in place. Um, again, RegTech's a huge play, place um, to, to play in that. In that. Um, but also government moving to standardised type platforms. We've looked at things like the personal property security regime, very complex regime, looking at ways that uh, RegTech smart form, smart websites can cut through um, and help people uh, lodge. Uh, and so that's for things like um, cars, showing your security interests in cars and other business equipment and things. Um, making it as simple as possible to be able to apply for it and use the system. Uh, single touch payroll, and I think we're going to get, hear a little bit about this today, again, offers a lot in this space. So uh, last slides, just uh, I think around the beauty that is RegTech, uh, the sprout from what is quite a, a complex and often dense regulatory environment. And, and so the way um, that I view uh, the, uh, what a good regulatory system is, it's comprised of good law slash regulation, so good law, good legal fra framework, plus good administration, and that's often mix, missed. Um, great law can be horrible for small business when it's not applied well, but this is where also RegTech can come and play. And in something like, I've mentioned uh, PPSR, the Personal Property Securities Register, that's where RegTech can come in over the top of what is quite complex law and make the administration the use of that um, small business friendly. Um, so I really look forward to hearing from my uh, other presenters here uh, and uh, yeah, uh, talking about the great thing that is RegTech. And I'll stop on that point. Thanks very much, Craig. Uh, we're now going to welcome Laura Muncie from uh, the Attorney General's office. You with us, Laura? Oh, there you go. I am. Thank you, Deb. You. Thank you, Deb. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present today. Um, like Craig, I'd, I'd like to start just acknowledging that I'm I'm on the Ngunnawal and Nambri country in Canberra. So I head up the usability section in the Attorney, General, Attorney General's Department's Workplace Relations Strategy Branch. My team's leading a project uh, it's called the Regulatory Technology Roadmap for Modern Awards, and it's really looking at what government can do to support and enable innovation and uptake of technology solutions that make life easier for businesses, particularly small businesses, to comply with modern awards and pay their staff correctly. If we have a look at the next slide, you see this sort of sets the scene for the, the awards landscape. We have 121 modern awards in Australia, and those awards directly cover around 2.6 million employees in Australia. There are many more employees that would have <clears throat> their, their paying conditions set by reference to the awards, either under individual contracts or enterprise agreements. So the awards provide that, that base safety net, if you like, for a range of different industries and occupations. Each award contains 
many different pay rates depending on factors such as age, experience, role, qualifications and that sort of thing. And then there's a range of allowances and, and loadings and, and things like that depending on time worked and other factors. So it's a pretty complex landscape as you can imagine. Some businesses may have to navigate multiple awards. They may have staff employed under different awards depending on, on their roles and, and things like that. So as you can see, it's potentially quite a, a complex landscape and it, it does take time, it costs money, um, and it can be a cause of stress, particularly for small businesses who, you know, just want to get it right, just want to focus on their business and things like that. So this is where the government's recognised there's an opportunity for technology to help businesses navigate through that compliance burden. Um, and that's where, where we're looking at, well, what's the government's role? What can we do to, to drive up innovation? So we see more products, um, particularly ones that are, are tailored to the small business market. Um, and what can we also do to support small businesses and, and employees to see what's out there and, and realise the benefits and hopefully see some of the, the sort of deregulation benefit flowing through. So on the next slide, um, we've got a visual representation of our RegTech roadmap. Um, this is essentially uh, the outcome of a co-design process we ran in early 2021 with a range of stakeholders from small business, the reg tech sector, um, the unions, industry groups and government agencies. We worked, we used that process to really understand um, how small businesses engage with the award systems, where those pain points are and identify where the opportunities were to um, you know, potentially use technology to help them navigate through some of those, those pain points. This roadmap sets out a range of opportunities um, over the short, medium and long term. And it's really intended as a guide for government decision making over time, recognising that the technology landscape will change over time. Um, and so the idea is to implement some of the initial steps that can be done fairly quickly and then look at what can be done in the, the medium and longer term and if that sort of will help move things along and help, um, you know, improve innovation in this space, then, then that's where, where we'll go. Government's committed um, to a number of the first initial steps and, and they're underway. These include things like our department setting up a working group with members of the reg tech sector um, where we meet to talk about what the government's doing in this space, but also to learn from, from them around, you know, challenges, barriers, um, things like that. So that's, that's now underway. That group meets every, every two months. Um, and we see that group as being really vital for ongoing information sharing and collaboration in this space. The other projects that are underway include the Ferret Commission um, and my colleague Trudy will, will shortly tell you a little bit more about their piece of work, but they're developing a, an API or a secure digital gateway from their modern awards pay database. I'll leave Trudy to, to tell you the ins and outs of that one. Moving, I guess, forward to the longer term, the roadmap, as I said, is a, a really good way to think about where do we want to be? Where do we see ourselves in five or 10 years? And one of the things we're very interested in exploring is does the, you know, what does the future look like in, in the awards space? Is there a future where awards might be issued in a much more digital ready format um, so that they could then be a lot, you know, much easier integrated into payroll and business software and things like that. Um, so we're at the very start of that journey. We're starting to um, explore some of the foundational questions and concepts around that. And by looking at, at that at, at the moment, I think that will help us understand sort of where to next on the roadmap. Do we sort of follow the, the paths and, and things or, you know, is that longer term future goal something that's that's attainable in a shorter time um, or is it is it you know not the way to go so that's that's where we are it's the start of a, a very interesting journey um, I think that's really all I wanted to touch base on but I'm very happy to um, take any questions I'll try and answer anything in the chat that people put through um, but otherwise I'd like to hand over to Trudy Jones from the Ferret Commission to talk you through their modern awards pay database Thanks, Thank Laura. You. Thanks very much. Um, firstly, I'd, I'd also like to acknowledge the um, Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation who are the traditional owners of the lands on which I, um, where I'm meeting with you today. Um, so to start off with, um, it's nice. Thanks to everyone for, for being with us today. I'm excited to talk to you a little bit about the Modern Awards Pay database and how it has the potential to be 
a play a small part in in the area of workforce solutions. So this is just one part of a bigger picture, which is which was outlined in the Reg Tech roadmap by Laura. So if we could go to the next um, slide. I just wanted to clarify for the audience, the Fair Work Commission, what our role is. So we are the National Workplace Relations Tribunal. We deal with a number of disputes, but one of the most, I guess, key roles that, that the Fair Work Commission plays is in setting minimum wages and conditions of employment across Australia. And um, Laura's talked a little bit about the awards. Um, so there are 121 industry and occupational awards across Australia, and that affects, um, she mentioned, um, there's a, approximately 2.66 million um, employees who are paid directly under the, the award. And um, the work that I do at the Fair Work Commission specialises specifically in modern awards. The modern awards are made through the fair, process through the Fair Work Commission, and um, the, any adjustments or variations to those awards occur through the Fair Work Commission. So if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide, um, I just wanted to explain what the Mon Awards Pay Database is before we talk about it in terms of it being a um, workforce solution. So the Fair Work Commission, in, in fulfilling its role of um, setting minimum wages, it actually had this problem at face that it needed a really efficient um, centralised and secure mechanism for um, recalculating all those minimum rates and allowances and, and penalties in any annual wage review. So we built a database and we started in 2019 um, and we used it for the first time in 2020 in the annual wage review. It, it um, being a, a central storage place, it also means that that it, you can also use that that central repository for research, um, for analysis, and it, it acts as like a big calculator for recalculating all the rates in the annual wage review. And we have linked that um, to the dynamically to the actual modern award documents so that all those dollar figures are actually populated and generated from the, the database into the awards themselves. So that was quite a big transformation for the commission. If you if you want to go to the to the next slide, I guess I wanted to emphasize that that once we built the database and it also fit the timing of our build sort of fitted in nicely with this new agenda that the, the government was considering with RegTech um, and the RegTech roadmap. Um, so um, Laura mentioned that there are some some complexities in the modern award system. It's um the workplace relations system is quite complex. Um, and, and it affects a number of working Australians and um, many stakeholders have told us that, that they do find it quite challenging because of there's different age categories, there's different classifications, there's um, some people are getting paid penalties depending on the time of day they're working or the day of the week. So it just makes it um, fairly complex for anyone who who works in the area of payroll and not to mention um, small businesses that are that are trying to um, comply with that and the consequences are significant so um, as you probably can imagine um, there's the consequence of underpayment for the employees but also there are some significant penalties um, that that can apply so if you go to the next slide um, so what the Fair Work Commission has done is it's, it's sort of identified this issue um, and then at the same time the, the RegTech roadmap was um, came into fruition and it was identified in that roadmap that building an application programming interface for modern awards would um, would actually for, for the pay the specific pay amounts in the modern awards would actually go some way to to perhaps make this um, complex system easier to understand and easier to navigate. So, so we went through that transformation from a manual process to an automated internal process to now this future state where we have in the last um, uh, roughly six months, I guess from December 2021 to, to, to really the end of March, we've built an ap application programming interface. We went out to and conducted user acceptance testing and have, um, we're just in the final stages now and we, we haven't got our um, go light go live date finalised yet, but we, we're getting closer and should be able to announce that soon. And the idea of this is that that um, software developers will be able to access the the data from the source, the minimum, um, the modern awards pay data database through the APIs 
actually design their tools to connect to it and hopefully we're we're we're, all, we're hopefully that it will promote um innovation in the sector in the payroll sector um some of the use cases that we explored when we when we originally did our consultation for this um solution was um on uh, it could be used for onboarding a new staff member helping to identify the correct classification and and what the rate of pay should be it could be used for um any time payroll's done the idea is that you get that seamless um, solution where you get the minimum rates of pay from the Fair Work Commission through the API, do your run your payroll, and of course through single pass touch payroll, that would then go through to the Australian Taxation Office at the other end. So it's sort of in, in a perfect world covering that full life cycle. Um, so that's the sort of use cases that we looked at, and I'd be happy at the end to to take your questions about the solution that we've built. Thanks, Trudy. And you can also pop your questions um, to Trudy in the in the chat. And Trudy, uh, during the next uh, uh, little bit, happy if you want to jump on and um, uh, jump on and answer those. Thank you. Yes. So uh, we are now going to see and hear from three RegTech um, founders. Um, there'll be Cassie, Rowena, and Mark in that order. Um, when your time is, uh, when you've got about 30 seconds to go, you'll see my image come back up just so that we can keep this on track and we've got enough time for our panel at the end. So let's start with Cassie from Carol Clark. Welcome, Cassie. Thank you so much. Thanks, Deborah. And I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm presenting from Ghanaland or our Adelaide office today. I'm a special counsel in Carol Clark's employment law team, and we predominantly uh, represent employers. So and a huge part of my practice is advising employers on award compliance. So I've noticed a number of trends and common issues that have been facing my clients. So what I'll take you through today is three of those areas or of concern for my clients and the workforce solution that we've developed, which we're finding is assisting them really well in this area. So if we can move to the next slide, uh, the first area that's a huge problem for a number of employers is award classifications. And as you know, getting an award classification right from the outset will go a long way to our clients being able to pay their people correctly. But our clients were telling us that they were overwhelmed by the detail. Often award classification schedules run over many pages um, or they involve defined terms or they uh, have multiple classification streams. And many of our clients weren't understanding the legal approach to classification. So sitting behind an award classification schedule is a whole lot of law that tells us it's not just about looking at the amount of time an employee might spend on a particular task, that's not determinative. We need to actually turn our minds to the significance of a task that they're performing. So if we can move to the next slide and that'll deal with the solution that we've come up with. And it's not terribly tech heavy, but it's a way of using technology to make classifications much more user friendly for our clients. So they're effectively presented to our clients in a, a survey type format where we've simplified the descriptions and the uh, different award levels for them. Uh, but I think the key element of this and where we see real success with it is that we uh, bring the threshold matters or the critical elements to the fore. That's the first thing that our clients will look at because often it might be tucked away deep down in the award classification schedule that a particular qualification is determinative and will mean that someone is a level four, for example. But we ask those questions outright and that means that our clients save a lot of time not looking at irrelevant classifications. So, for example, if our client is covered by the nurses award and they want to find what award a registered nurse or what level I should say a registered nurse is um, covered by. Um, the, the classifications in that award go over about 12 pages, but if they click at the outset that we're talking about a registered nurse here, that immediately brings it right down and all they're looking at is the registered nurse relevant levels and again with those user friendly descriptions so and we also include prompts which require our clients to assign grades of significance to certain tasks and at the end what will be produced is a report based on all of those inputs um, that tells them based on all of that information and based on those threshold matters and the significant tasks we believe that 
their employee would be covered by X level. And you can imagine that there's a massive benefit to big business with this, because if you're doing this task quite regularly and have large cohorts of employees, this is a really user friendly and quick way to work through that exercise. And for smaller business, sometimes it's just not cost or time effective for them to get lengthy legal advice from us. So if they're one of our member employers who has access to our portal, they can use this tool and rather than having to um, fork out the the coin for um, legal advice on each and every occasion uh, they need to classify an employee. On to the next slide, our second biggest problem in this area of award compliance is that I found a number of um, employers were coming up to us telling us that they paid people an all inclusive pay rate or salary, but they weren't really having regard to all the applicable award entitlements mathematically and being satisfied that they had all been properly covered. It was more of a gut feel or a market rate or the result of a negotiation. And this is so important because as we know, there were new annualised salary rules a few years ago, which require um, that certain considerations are taken into account. And also if we've got a new starter coming on board, then the other issue is that we want to make sure that if we're paying them an all-inclusive salary or pay rate, we need to make sure it actually covers off on all of their applicable entitlements. So on the next page, um, our solution has been to effectively convert the award provisions in a whole range of awards into formulas which drive calculations. And we engage with our clients through an instruction sheet um, where they tell us about what applicable allowances there are or loadings. But then we overlay the calculations over whatever data they can produce to us. So it might be roster data, it might be time and attendance and payroll data. And using that or even a sample roster for a new starter, we can say, well, we've applied the calculations for all the irrelevant, the relevant um, award provisions. And we've identified that there's a potential shortfall or that you're compliant. And we can also do quite bespoke reviews. If a client comes to us and says, can you check my compliance with penalty? rates or one at the moment a client has asked if we can run a report on whether they are giving breaks correctly in accordance with their award. So we're going to produce an award, a, a report based on their time and attendance data and identify each occasion where certain breaks haven't been given. I'm mindful Deborah's just popped up. So on the next slide, my very last quick point is just the real issue in this area is our clients just missing some changes to the law. You can imagine they've got a whole range of distractions and resourcing constraints, particularly smaller businesses. So on the next slide, what we've got is our solution, and that is that clients who have access to our portal in this area, um, we know their award because they've told us because we've got an ongoing relationship with them where we conduct reconciliations for them. And we push out notifications or alerts to them when there's a pay rate increase, when there's an amendment to their award, or if we find that there's a significant interpretation decision. So a few different ways that we apply reg tech here. Again, not always terribly tech heavy, but they're really we're really trying to use techno technology to present some of this information that's really complicated to our clients in a much more user friendly way. Thanks, Deborah. Thanks, Cassie. Great work. Uh, I'd like to welcome Rowena. Thank you, Rowena. And similarly, about four minutes 30, my face will pop up. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Deborah, and hello, everyone. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm presenting today from the lands of the Turrbal people in Brisbane. Um, we are one of those innovative tech solutions that's addressing the complexity that faces employers around making sure that they've got all the compliance records in place for their employees and are paying people correctly. Thanks, Hong. Can I get you to move to the next slide, please? So we're an all-in-one cloud-based solution that helps an employer onboard new staff, schedule them, make sure that we're capturing worked hours, Put it through an award engine so that we make sure that we're capturing all of those award provisions, penalty rates over time, all of those other allowances that need to kick into play before processing the payroll and reporting that information back to the ATO as part of single touch payroll reporting. And then finally, all the reports that fall off the back of payroll processing around um, payroll activity reporting, leave liability reporting, and obviously all of the compliance records for employee. Thanks, Hong. So what does it look like? Look, we've tried to intentionally um, move some of that administrative burden 
back onto the prospective employee so that they can work through a self-guided onboarding journey, making sure that their employer has all of that important compliance documentation before the employee starts working for them. That covers things like qualifications, all of the industry specific licenses and certifications, Australian work rights, and obviously all of the bank super and tax information that an employer needs to pay people. Thanks, Hong. We've got some apps in play um, that gives an employee direct access into their employee life cycle. They'll be able to use that to manage their availability, see their upcoming work schedule, um, all of their pay slip records, anything else that's a requirement for an employee to have access to, not just while they're engaged with that employer, but also post engagement. Thanks, Tom. There is a rostering system that's built into our system. This will throw warnings for an employer. So if they're putting people onto work at times of day where penalty rates might apply, alerts around um, overtime, exceeding maximum ordinary hours per day, and we're presenting that information to the employer as they're scheduling the staff before it's been communicated out to those employees so that they can start managing their, their business efficiently, um, effectively, and make sure that they're covering off all of their compliance obligations. Post-scheduling, if we can move to the next slide, we move into time and attendance. So obviously employers have an obligation to record the hours that a person has worked for them, not just the start in time on any given day, but also the break durations throughout the course of the day, making sure that the person's had the appropriate paid and unpaid breaks at the correct time of day, understanding that if that break has been taken too late in the day, that there might be some, some implications around penalty rates that need to apply. Once we have those worked hours, there's then a workflow for a manager to review and approve that. And in our system, as they're approving those hours, it runs that information through our award interpretation engine to calculate the pay for them. As we've heard, it's complex. Awards are challenging, um, making sure that you've determined is it day rates, is there afternoon penalties or evening penalties, consecutive shifts, um, breaks, overtime, um, all of those things need to be taken into consideration when building up the pay slip for the employee at the end of the pay period. Um, and that's what a computer can do really effectively um, for the employer. And if we go to the next slide, we then present that information back to the employer. So this is a, a view within the system that shows the employer exactly how the system has calculated that person's pay. Um, so it will break it down on a day by day basis. The yellow is indicating that there's overtime. They can understand exactly what rule from the award is being applied to that particular time frame. Once they've reviewed that information, it's then up to the employer to produce the payroll. That's a single click process. So we've tried to keep it as simple as we possibly can. In clicking that button, they're not only generating the pay slips, but they're also reporting that information straight back to the ATO as part of their single touch payroll reporting. And then obviously super obligations also apply and we've allowed them to process super directly from our system through into a clearinghouse. And off the back of all of that, we then allow them to access their reports. Thanks Hong, next slide. Um, so obviously we've got reporting back to their general ledger so they can understand their wage costs, leave liability, end of financial year and STP reporting, as well as all of those other compliance obligations that the employer has around, um, you know, making sure that their staff have current and valid Australian work rights, that none of those licenses or certifications that a person needs to have to work in that particular sector have expired. Thank you. I think I kept Thanks, the time. Serena. Thanks, Deborah. Well done. And we've already got a question for you on the chat. If you wanted to go and address that for us, that'd be awesome. Thank you so much. I'd like to welcome Mark Jenkins from WageSafe. Um, similarly, Mark, at four minutes and 30, my face will appear and that's your uh, cue to wrap up. Thank you so much. Thanks, Deb. Thank you. Um, I too would like to acknowledge uh, the Wango uh, clan of the Aurora country. Um, and I'd also like to thank you, Deb, for um, the, the, the exposure you're bringing to this topic through 
RegTech, and we're pleased to be members. So um, WaveSafe is a, is a SaaS solution, a software as a service solution providing um, a real-time underpayment solution for SMBs. Um, our background is that we've come from analytics and employment relations, and we realised that there was a requirement for real-time feedback for the employer rather than necessarily um, remediation of underpayments to enable them to, to tackle this underpayment issue on the fly. So we sit between the measurement or the time and attendance, the measurement of, of um, employees' time and, and the payment, so the payroll. So next slide, please. Um, so the challenge we're faced with is so that how then can we utilise our core skills in, in analytics and our understanding of employment relations to provide this, this real-time solution. So on the next slide, I've, I've, show, I've got here three or four, sorry, challenges that I think could be relevant to the audience um, in, in applying this. So we've conducted over 3,000 audits under payment audits, audits in the SMB sector, and probably won't surprise you that the majority of situations that we uncover um, with underpayments are un unintentional, and subsequently they're a surprise to the employer. And support surprises in, in this sector um, typically lead to disaster. So employers not having the financial capacity for the repayments. And so we, 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 were, we became very focused then on how we could help them on a day-to-day -day basis or on, a, on an everyday payroll basis have the capacity or the capability to audit every single employee, every single payroll, so that they can actually remediate this on the run. And I've said that then, the, the obvious question then is, well, well are payments, underpayments in, um, consistent? And yes, they are, but I suppose the misconception is, is that it's all driven by misinterpretation of the award. It's a large part, or it's, it's, it's a significant problem. However, um, we see misinterpretation probably only at about 10% um, of the cases that we come across. The rest, or I'll break them down, about 20% typically lies in the technology that they're using, not necessarily um, technical limitations, but quite often just how the tech is set up and how people are actually using that technology to monitor underpayments. But the remainder, 70%, is actually in people and processes. And um, as you could imagine, um, if, if it is people and process driven, it's, 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 it's far more difficult for the employer to monitor this and it can't be expected um, for that to be done necessarily by the time and attendance system. So you could also imagine that if, if uh, a manager is consistently applying incorrect start times or break times or um, the trigger of overtime calculations that over time this can lead to uh, chronic underpayments and, and, and a significant um, amount of money. So leading to these last two points, what's required then to handle that people and process issue is analytics. And we've then identified how we can bring together multiple applications because a key issue is, is that people don't have access to all the information, time attendance, payroll, HRIS, ideally point of sale or revenue data in the one spot, bringing that together to actually identify um, through analytics patterns and behaviours that are driving the underpayments. So this has this to happen across multiple time periods or payroll periods as well to be able to pick up um, what those trends are and why, why there are outliers. So next, um, next slide. So the outcome then is that we see an environment not too far in the future where employers uh, are, are communicating around proactive compliance. So they're proud of the fact that they've got a strong market reputation, they're promoting employee advocacy and, and, they're, and they're communicating that to the market. 
significant drops in payroll team costs, um, both through the administration of remediation and um, more immediate access to data, and um, then identifying source issues, going back to the source, and obviously the key one is brand risk and um, reputational risk, and reducing that. The last slide. So um, yes, we I'd welcome any input from participants today into their approach internally to assurance as opposed to remediation and ongoing and a real time means of actually addressing addressing this issue. And um, thank you very much, Deb. Thanks very much, uh, Mark. Well done. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to hand back to Craig, who um, has the challenge within 10 minutes to run a panel uh, discussion with our speakers. So could I invite the speakers uh, to come back online? Um, that would be awesome. Just turn your cameras on, that's it. Um, and it'll be a challenge because it's a large panel, uh, but I've got it in your very capable hands to get us uh, to the finish line, Craig. Thank you. Let's see. Thanks, Deborah. Let's see if I can wow you on this one. Um, look, great presentations. Uh, so, so thank you so much uh, for those. Uh, some really good things to think about. And I'm going to ask you all, I think, the same question, uh, just to, to throw you all as well. Uh, and really interested in any advice you might give, so it's a two-parter, any advice you might give for small business to, to step into this area? What's the jump off point? And also um, speaking more broadly around RegTech, what do you see are the gaps or challenges, alternatively the opportunities in this area? And so if I can throw to, let's work in reverse order. Mark, let's work up the line. Yeah, so um, I think, I think um, it's understanding that there is, for, for the employer, understanding that, that as we see it, that it's very, very difficult through both the complexity of the awards, but just the ongoing human element to get this correct. And um, I, subsequently, we, we're passionate about the fact that there needs to be this ongoing mechanism to monitor it. Uh, and it, it needs to be accepted that it's going to be a, a part of a part of life. It's either going to be assurance or remediation. And we believe that you're better off being well prepared rather than having to scramble after the fact. So uh, my advice would definitely be jump on the front foot and monitor this regularly. Thanks, Mark. I'll throw to Rowena, same question. Yeah, I guess obviously our advice to small business would be to find a system that makes it easy to manage your compliance obligations because there's you know, lots of businesses out there who are still using pen and paper um, and there's always an element of human error that's going to be involved in those types of solutions, not to mention a heck of a lot of stress. Um, so let computers do what computers can do well, which is algorithms, um, so that you can actually focus on the stuff that computers don't do well, which is managing the business and managing people. So moving up the chain, Cassie, so tips for small business stepping in and what's the challenges, the opportunities? Yeah. I think um, the, my tip for a small business would be to really look firstly internally at where your capability lies, because I think that sometimes um, I've seen some clients that have uh, gone and engaged a provider or a solution, but it's maybe been too complex or too, um, it, it didn't really connect with what their capability was internally. So they kind of thought, okay, I've done that task now and it's just working it all out for me in the background, but it's they've needed someone with a little bit more experience or knowledge to be able to know how to use that tool properly. So I think it's about finding the tool that suits your uh, internal knowledge and your capabilities well and that will actually fill the gap for you on what you need in terms of compliance and I think the real challenge is exactly that keeping up with it and finding something that actually works for your business because it's not really just a one-size-fits-all approach I think that there are some nuances to certain businesses and industries so it's really the challenge is to find the thing that works for you. Thank you and so Next, I've got, I think, a treat for Trudy and, and Laura. I'd love those same questions, but there's uh, a, a question that's arisen in, in the chat and you may want to uh, address this. Uh, so would the Fair Work Commission or Attorneys Generals be willing to endorse an interpretation of their awards as being correct? 
Thanks, Craig. Um, <laughs> look, that's that's a really good question, and it's it's something that that has been raised and has been explored and considered to some extent. I think the short answer is at the moment, no, that's not not something that that we can do. Um, and it's it, you know, Trudy, I don't know if you want to add anything, but it's part of the complexity in this space is, you know, there's the interpretation of awards is such a thorny and difficult area, and also the fact that. Unlike, say, the ATO, who is, you know, issues, you know, issue is, is this sort of determinator of whether you comply with your ATO laws, and so they can, if they issue a, a tax determination that says this is the interpretation that that we accept, and if it's subsequently changed and you comply with it in in all good faith, they won't pursue you. In the employment law space, it's a bit more complex because I suppose at the end of the day, the the right to seek a remedy lies with the employee themselves. So it's not really for government to say, if you follow this interpretation, you're all good, because at the end of the day, an employee can go and challenge that. And it's it's their right. And a court can say, well, regardless, you know, they're owed a, a, an entitlement and they haven't been paid correctly and they have to pay it. So that's, that's some of the complexity. I think a, another factor is just some of the the practicalities, the resources that would be needed to endorse, you know, every single product and interpretation that's out there. Um, and I think that's also why we're interested in exploring the, the sort of long term moving towards rules as code, because I think if you had a situation where rules were made in a more digital ready format, you start to kind of cut out that that middle, you know, interpreting them and translating them into code and things like that, if they're, if they're all sort of a much more authoritative digital ready format. Um, you know, acknowledge that that's still a long way to go um, and it is a, a tricky place. But, um, yeah, that, it, it's certainly something that know that there's a lot of interest in there and know that it's something that that is considered from time to time. But at this point, it's it's just not something that the government's um, exploring for, for those reasons. Trudy, did you want to add anything on that one? I think you're on mute, Trudy. Sorry. Thanks for reminding me. I do apologise. Yeah, I think, no, I think, Laurie, I think you've covered that well. I think it, it, it is related to the nature of, of the system and, and the fact that there it's a complex thing. There are, you know, for example, the Fair Work Commission can, in effect, issue a decision which would be this is in, and that would be endorsing an interpretation, so to speak, if I could use that very loosely. But then another court, a federal court, could have a different interpretation. So it's given the nature of the way workplace relations system works, it would be very hard to do that. Craig, I'm happy if you want to take that question um, in the chat. If you can, um, if you can see that as the as the kind of the final question, if that's okay. Yeah, no, I, I was just thinking about where, where, <laughs> whether because I love that other question, whether I enter the fray on that one because. Uh, some of the ideas we've had, uh, our office has had over time, and these may be other people's ideas as well, have been around reg tech and whether there could ever be and what changes would need to happen to the system uh, for there to be effectively an accreditation of um, products of reg, reg tech. So if you honestly uh, use them, then you're not up for sort of penalties. You're up for the the actual amount that you owe, but not the um, penalties on top. And I don't know if I just throw that out there with anyone wants to pick at that or just let it go to keeper. <laughs> yeah, look again, again, Craig. That's that's one that you know, it has absolutely been been interesting. It's been raised, and I, I think again, it's such a thorny and difficult issue. And I guess you know, putting on you know colleagues at, at the Fair Work Ombudsman sort of hat. Um, it's such a complex issue, you know, what, where's the line between, you know, if, if there's non-compliance, you know, it, it's very easy to sort of say, well, I, you know, I think, I think the risk with doing that would be, do you make it, you know, do you risk employers kind of relying too heavily on the software and not actually engaging with their obligations and just going, I just did what the software told me, I thought I'd be fine. Um, so that's that's one of the risks. I think the other one is is the resourcing, you know, who who would have the skills and capability and resourcing to kind of go through and check the coding and the interpretation in each each product that's out there. And, um, you know, and then there's probably commercial and, and IP type considerations and things like that. So, look, it's, you know, it's a thorny issue. I'm not not ruling it out. That would never be something that would be considered. But yeah, again, it's it's one of those things that at this point um, the, where the priorities lie, it's it's one that's sort of sitting in the not now. Um, um, and yeah, as I said, hopefully kind of 
looking at that rules as code sort of opportunity is is sort of where we go. But um, yeah, and I think these are sort of issues that that we use our our working group with the industry to to talk through some of these sort of ideas and challenges. And you know, if it's not accreditation, are there other things the government can do to help them? navigate through some of the ambiguities and, and areas of complexity that we're all dealing with. Certainly a good one to think about going going forward. And just to uh, make this very unruly to finish it off, um, just thinking if there are any three, few words from anyone on this uh, question that's popped up around um, small business um, literacy to engage with uh, government agencies and regulatory obligations. So, so how can we help support small business do that? So anyone who wants to have a stab? Did you, I, I was just going to say, I guess you've got to start with, um, you need to seek out the, the, the respective sort of bodies have a, a and set up a, a some sort of co-design with some of the business engage with them and then hopefully those representatives can give you some insight into how you can educate you need to start with the small business and not assume assume that you understand them and and and, and yes basically that I think that the small businesses have to drive the conversation and to start to answer, just jumping on from our perspective as well, it's often about um, the trusted advisors and other ways to support small business. So um, you probably will rarely see us talking about education. It's about how do you make the system work for small business? Um, anyone else want to take a stab? I think from, from our perspective, the more that government sort of takes a, a user-centred approach, the more that we're actually talking and, and hearing the voices and the experience directly of, of those end users. Um, and I think that's that's happening more across government, but I think it's, you know, it's it's an area that if, you know, the more focus, the better. And it, it sometimes really cuts through when you actually hear in the words of a small business, yeah, that's all very well, but this is my day-to-day -day experience. So, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big advocate for, for the usability concept and, and the human-centred design approach. Um, and continuing, you know, not just sort of taking it as a point in time and then going back to your bureaucratic sort of ways, but, you know, continuing those conversations and touch points. Thanks, um, everyone. We might need to leave it there. I'm really sorry. I know there are still some more questions, but what you could do is pop your questions in the chat. Also put your email address in there if you dare, um, and so that um, our speakers or others could pick that up and, and take that up as a separate uh, conversation. Sorry, there's obviously a lot to talk about in this uh, sector and you know we we I think we've all recognized the complexity in um, the complexity of the of the awards system and the employment compliance area but it's so great to see that there's a massive opportunity for small business here to engage with some great reg tech companies who can actually really be able to change um, you know change their lives really and also so great to see that government have really got a focus on this too to drive innovation um, into the sector. Um, you know, to promote the overall um, stability of the system. So, so great to see. So I want to thank uh, Craig for uh, leading us today. And also thank you to all of the speakers. We've got, I'm going to try and remember everybody's name, Mark, Rowena, Cassie, Trudy and Laura. How did I do? I got there. Uh, thanks so much uh, for your contributions and thanks to everybody uh, that came. Really super quickly, you can see we've got a slide up there that's talking about our next um, events coming up. Uh, there's a member event on the 9th of June in Sydney. Um, we'll be announcing other centres soon. We've got a face-to-face -face big fancy gala dinner happening on the 27th of October in Sydney. So please do mark your diaries. We've got a bunch of other uh, showcase events uh, coming up soon too, which you can see the dates for those there. All of those are available on our website. And finally, no more slides. Thank you. Um, we'll uh, call things to a close. Um, thanks very much for being here. See you next time. Yeah.